This is our uh, 12th or 14th team member, Wobbles. We adopted a wombat from the World Wildlife Foundation. Just point that out for you guys. <laughs> so, my name is Mike Johnstone. I'm Turtle Producer here. I'm a serious blue wombat. We're very proud to present a whole lot of work. Uh, just a brief introduction. A few of the team members. We'll start off with the programmers on my right and your left. Uh, Desde Venezuela, Emilio Castillo. Yeah. Our design lead, Aaron Karowski. Yeah. Our studio namesake, John Kilbane. Yeah. Nathan Price. Yeah. Our tech lead, Nathan Fowl. Yeah. And our QA lead, Sean Young. Back over here to my left and your right, we have our art lead, Ben Mullins. <laughs> Zach Topping. <laughs> Mr. Zach Winkler. <laughs> and my co-producer and an honor to work with him, Nick Johansson. <laughs> to get us started on a little bit about Blank, we're gonna have Sean Young come up here and give you guys the spiel. Uh, the PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, I did it. <laughs> no clicking. <laughs> Sabotage. <laughs> anyway. Hello. <laughs> Completely threw me off. So, what I'm here to talk about is our game, Blank. Now, what is Blank? It's a rather nondescript title, I'll admit, so allow me to descript it. Blank takes place in a three-dimensional world from a two-dimensional perspective. So it's a two and a half D platformer, and this world happens to be an abandoned laboratory. Not a good place to be in any media. Books, movies, games, in real life, horrible. Now, in this game, the player takes control of our adorable little ball of DNA that we have named, any guesses? Blank. Blank, excellent guess, people who already knew. <laughs> <laughs> now, what are you going to be doing with Blank? Well, here's some controls. We have running and jumping, basic platformer stuff, but Blank also has the ability to assimilate other creatures' DNA and gain their abilities. So, hypothetically speaking, if you were to absorb the DNA of a gorilla, then you could turn your arms into gorilla arms and punch your foes into oblivion. Or if you were, theoretically, to absorb the DNA of a frog, then you could turn your legs into frog legs and navigate on balls. Or, stab in the dark here, if you were to absorb the DNA of a hawk, you could probably manifest some wings on your back and fly. I don't know, just guesses. Now what are you going to find in this world? Well, there's life pickups, which you're going to need. You will need those. You're, you're going to die a lot. I'm sorry. But we also have some enemies. Our enemies are robotic sentries that have remained ever vigilant despite this lab being abandoned a long time ago. And they come in two flavors. The flying herps and the walking derps. Herps before derps, everybody. And on the bottom middle and bottom left, we have the ever-classic spikes and lasers. You can't go wrong with spikes and lasers. And uh, here's some illustrations of what I just talked about. We've got uh, on the right, top right, and bottom right, we have herps flying and derps walking. In the middle, we have the crusher about to perform its namesake on blank. And uh, we have, uh, on the left, we have some platforms, lasers, and falling spikes. Platforms being the only thing I mentioned that will not kill you. And so, I'm going to round my time off with some key features. Now, I already mentioned the abilities that you gain from other creatures' DNA, and you use those to navigate our 20-plus action-packed rooms. Here's a secret. It's 26. 20-plus 20 is 26. There it is. And those end in a climactic, multi-phase boss battle, which determines whether or not you really deserve to beat this game. And uh, all this while, you're traversing an immersive environment. Immersive because of the sound effects developed by the sound team, uh, backgrounds customized for each individual room, and my personal favorite, colored lights. 
But to talk more about the backgrounds and what went into making this world look the way it does, I'm going to hand this off to our High Chancellor of Art, Ben Mullins. Hey, how's everybody doing out there? So, yeah. All right, so the art theme for our game is centered around the struggle of technology versus nature. Whereas you have Blank, this organic creature stuck in an abandoned technological lab, devoid of all human life. There's no other humans and no other animals. So the way we represent this was by using a dark color palette throughout most of our levels and photo sourcing those textures with grime and dirt to give it that abandoned feel. Um, in this photo right here, you can see that Blink stands out from everything else. Why? Because everything else around him is metal machinery and Blink is organic life. Also, you get that good contrast of Blink's texture versus the environment texture. Some of the art challenges we ran into early in production uh, started out with how do we get Blink's abilities across? How does the player actually ape swing? How does the player actually manifest wings and fly away? So uh, we had to sit down and figure out the method. And what we did was we took all those images you see on the right side are all separate rigs and meshes. And basically we weapon swapped them. So if you guys can picture Mr. Potato Head and you rip off his arms and he put arms back on, that's basically what we did with Blink. Uh, another art challenge we had, we had to do a late iteration on the character. So the character you see on the screen right there, that was our old Blink, cute and adorable. And now new Blink is kind of, I don't know, you decide. <laughs> <laughs> I like him, I like him. Um, and one of the last art challenges, which happens in all pipelines, is when we take our art and we try to get into the editor and see how it works, sometimes it always doesn't go right. And since our editor and our engine use the same renderer, we're able to tell right away whether this would be good or bad. But to talk more about the cohesiveness between the Maya and the engine, here's Nate Price. Thank you, Ben. Um, like Ben said, we decided to use an editor with ours. This is a screenshot of our entire map. Um, something that the editor really helps us with is it allows us to have an exact idea of what the game will look like in the final pass without actually having to put it into the game and possibly break something because every time you change something in the game, it always runs that possibility. Um, the editor allows both the programmers and the artists to move objects, place lights, move spawn points, everything that we need to do to create content, iterate on the levels, make it, make it fun. Uh, the editor allows us to do that. Um, as you can see, we have several sections with the colors, as uh, Sean said, colored lights. Um, <coughs> towards the end, though, we did notice that some of the rooms had less fun with them, they were less polished, less as cohesive as others. So with the editor, we're simply able to move rooms. It, it's kind of hard to see, but towards the right, we have a floating room because it just it didn't fit. So using the editor, we were able to simply pull the room out and plug the other rooms. To talk about what went right and what went wrong, here is John Kilbane. Thank you, Nate. During uh, any five-month project, of course there's going to be problems. We ran into them like every other team. Uh, just to touch on a few of these, uh, the Air Smash solution, one of our abilities in the game is an arcing overhead swing with gorilla arms. And one of our challenges was really getting the aesthetic feel of a swing, a gorilla swing, that animation to match up and be fun and make it actually feel like you were gorilla swinging an enemy and making it pop at the right time. Our buggy extended mode. We had 50 extra levels ready and like created to be put into the game, but we kind of waited till the very last minute and in the last couple days, actually putting the levels from the editor into the game just was a little too much for us and we couldn't get that in. Uh, and lastly, art iteration. Artists, whenever they wanted to adjust one thing in the background of any of the rooms, they would have to re-export the whole room's background. And this was just causing a little more work than they needed. Uh, everything goes wrong in projects, but what goes right? We had great tools. Uh, like Nate was talking about, we had the level editor. We were able to put together our entire game. We were able to just go in there, goof around in the level editor, make just levels that made no sense, but they were fun. We were able to do all that because of these tools. We were constantly in the testing room, constantly getting feedback. 
one of the biggest things that, uh, that our programmers did was we split into two groups, one group for tech, one group for gameplay. What this allowed us to do was, if anyone was having trouble on any of their sections, someone else from their group also was working in the same uh, spots as they were, so they were able to come in and help them out and pick it up for them. Uh, and lastly, teamwork. Our teamwork was amazing. Every day we were playing hacky sack. We had the entire team in a hacky sack circle. We've done it once. We've gotten it all the way around. When we weren't playing hacky sack, we were watching movies. And when we weren't working, we were team working. So that was great. <laughs> but who's, who's ready to see the game? <laughs> Let's go live. I'm going to hand it off to Nate Fowle and Sean Young. Thank you, Kilbane. Here, Sean's gonna load this up here. <coughs> I'll take a second to talk about Wobbles here. <laughs> wobbles is our wombat. Mysterious and blue. Wrong <laughs> We actually went to the World Wildlife Fund and, down, and uh, adopted a wombat from the wild, from Australia. So they sent us this cute little plushie to go with him. And we named him Wobbles. Okay, now we're getting into the game here. Sean's gonna make a new profile, or just use that one. Okay. We're gonna start off going to the options, make sure everything's good. Adjust that music and sound a little bit, up the gamma. Okay, save that out. As you see, we have lots of different modes here. Like we added in the extended play, arcade, time trial, we're just going to play the normal mode today. You have to download the game if you want to see any of the others. You see we have the comic strip here of what happened to the lab. You see they had lots of test animals all over the place. And they got loose and the guard robots annihilated all of them. It's made just a mess of a laboratory. So that's where it leaves us blank in a lonely DNA chamber that we're going to blast out of here real soon. Uh, here we go, and here's Blank! Yeah. Woo! Sean's gonna move and rock around here. Grab the free life right off the bat. And as Sean said, you're gonna die a lot. So we're really generous right off the bat there. Right here he's gonna go his first test. See if he can make it on that platform. Ooh, not made it. Not looking good for Sean so far. Now we're gonna up the challenge a little bit here. There's three platforms, all in a row. Usually he doesn't make this on his first try. We'll see how it goes. Oh, one jump. Waiting patiently for the second jump, and he makes it. Ooh, jumped early for that last one. It looks like we're getting our first ability here. That sounds like the West African white-back ape, known for his mean right punch. Oh! Right away, died to the crusher. First obstacle in the game, did not make it. <laughs> Getting a little nervous here. Okay, now we got our first hurt. You see we can do the punches there, and we got a different punch in the air. And when you hit an enemy in the air, you get an extra boost. So you gotta time your jumps just right to make it to the, to the area. As you see, we have to punch both of these to get up to that ledge up in the corner. Sean does it good the first time. And be really careful falling down this ledge here, punching all the herps down the way. And we're going to up the challenge quite a bit here. There's a lot of herps in this room, so be careful. Any wrong slip up and you'll fall to your death with the spikes below. Or just fall off the edge. <laughs> Try one more time here. Oh, you missed the second one. Uh, this, this red herp up here is called a suicide herp. What he'll do is he'll just run straight at Blank, just trying to just trying to blow up on his face. Sean's gonna go get that hidden secret life in the corner there. And now he's gonna continue on to this next room here, waiting patiently for the platform. And he's gonna wait more for some platforms here, because he sees he's got some falling spikes there. Gotta be careful. Not much mobility here. Ooh. Skillfully punches the spikes there. Oh, didn't make the jump. Oh, ooh, barely made it there. <laughs> Going for this next platform. We got two herps here. And you got to make sure he doesn't air smash them, because if he does, he'll fly right into the spikes at the top. 
Now here's one of the more challenging rooms. You're falling down, you have to, there's perks flying everywhere, there's spikes all over the wall. It's very hard to get through the bottom here. Suicide herp at the end, Sean forgot to punch. And he's got to do this room all over again. He's going to fall, hit, hit a few herps there, avoid most of them. There, he got it that time. Sean's going to wait for this platform at the end, but watch out, because shooting spikes from the wall, falling spikes from the ceiling, very dangerous ledge. He's going to wait patiently for the suicide herb, get over it. Now here we have our last gorilla room. We just put a whole bunch of herbs everywhere. Anyone slip up, there's spikes on the ground, anywhere. As you see, he just punched the derp, our melee enemy. He's got to play for five minutes already. Very, very nice achievement. I like that one. He's going to make it through the last area here, get the last herb, and he makes it over all the spikes. He's got to make it through this last derp. Okay, finish the gorilla rooms. Now, what kind of animal do we got here? Sounds like the Madagascar and poison dart frog, known for their wall sliding. He's gonna try to grab this free life up there. Very hard to do. Sean, oh, got on the second try. Very impressive. You see, we've got the wall jump there. If you listen carefully, he does a little womp womp for the little frogs there. Now he's gotta slide down this wall, avoiding some spikes and some lasers. Oh, you, just, you can stop on the wall if you press the button into the wall. Gotta wait. Ooh, punches that dirt. Gets away to the other side. Here's Sean's favorite thing to do is just tease this derp a little bit, walk back and forth. Punches it. There we go. <laughs> Move it on. Here we have two paths in this room. There's the way to the top, but there's a derp up there, and there's a herp at the bottom. If you see in the bottom, there's a free life down there, so I think Sean's gonna go for it. Yep. I'm gonna watch out for these spikes here, and then there's some more spikes here, but they're shooting spikes. Can't just fly through there. One more derp here at the end. Whoa! Almost, almost died there. He's gonna wait for it, punch it one more time. Ah, oh, I missed. Just out of spite, punches it anyways. Here's a little bit more complex room where we have to combine our abilities now. So he's got to punch it and then wall jump up here. And then avoid the crusher. And then this last area, there's falling spikes. Ooh, barely avoided that one. Now, it's very similar to that last room. So we got some more lasers in here. We got two derps now at the bottom here. Or two herbs, sorry. Oh, did he make it up high enough? Yes, he did. We're gonna get in this last area up here. Now in this room again, we have two paths. The bottom path has that free life, and the upper path, or the around the way path, has some shooting spikes and a weight of a wall. He's gonna go for the life, and he missed. Oh, got the life, but then he died. So now he's gonna take the upper path this time. Wait for the falling spikes there, and fall down. Barely misses all those spikes. Now he, here we have our last frog room. What he's going to do is expert room, move the ape climb. You know, lots of lots of shooting spikes here. Oh, did not jump over it. Good try though. Okay, here he goes. Slot falls right through all of them. Okay, climb up here. I believe Sean is going to go for this another free life down here at the bottom. Going to time this carefully to avoid the shooting spikes there. And then climb right back up. And we're going to go into the next room and gain our last ability. Let's see if I can figure out what animal this is. Ooh, sounds like the Alaskan red-tailed hawk. <laughs> Known for their flying. Oh, he flies right into the spikes. Not a good way to start Start with the hawk. So as you see, that's a fan blowing up there. It just blows you right up onto the top of those air and you bounce up there. And he's gonna take this second path up here, avoiding that derp. Uh, he hits it anyways. Goes on to this next room. Lots of fans, but 
here is our favorite Easter egg we have in our game, which Sean is going to show you. We call it Riding the Wind. It's a very cute little animation where he sits down in the wind and rides right up. Sean's going to go right into this last hawk room here. Now here we have to combo all three abilities. First he's got a wall jump, and then he's got a punch, and then he's got a double jump, just to get up there. He's going to fly over the spike. He's going to wait for this platform. Avoid that laser. He's got to be careful here, because if he air smashes that derp, he's going to fly right into that laser. So, he's got to carefully eat on the edge of this platform. Ooh, flies right into that laser. As you see, we give achievements for every kind of death in the game. We don't just give achievements for good things, we give achievements for bad things. All kinds of fun going on. And here's gotta do a really long jump and then eight punch and it barely makes it in there. We're going for this last free life here. Punch this herb one more time. And now we have our boss. You see on his hat, it says boss. He's shooting a laser at you, so you have to climb carefully up here and then hide. So you got very limited time to get up here. Here he's about to shoot the laser again. Sean, you make it in time? He does. Waits one more time. And he climbs back up here. Now we have our second boss room, which we call the Doom Room. This is the room that Sean actually created, so he should be good at this room, we'll see. You have 20 minutes to survive, falling spikes coming around everywhere. Gotta keep running, there's no exit yet. Oh, he did not make it in time. Now the time starts over every time you die. So you have to make it 20 seconds. You're dodging back and forth, weaving, weaving and waving, jumping. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Oh, the wave of spikes coming. Barely make it out of here in time then. Oh, we made it! Win the game, ladies and gentlemen. And this is Blank. Now I'm going to hand it over to our P, Nick Johansson, for questions and answers. Hello. Uh, we have two mics on the side. Nobody. <laughs> hey guys. Huh? This question is for uh, Nick and for Johnstone. Um, I saw you guys were doing some, uh, I guess, some iterations, doing some passes through your game. Did you guys, were you guys able to inject any Agile production stuff into your, uh, your development method process? So the question was, uh, did we manage to inject production methodologies into our game? Yeah, did you use Agile while you were producing the game? That's really my question. Okay, can you repeat that one more time? Did you guys use any Agile production methods in order to develop your game? Um, so how? I'll pass this off to Mike. Hey, uh, so your question was, uh, how much of Agile did, could we fit into uh, the production methodology inside Final Project? Yeah, pretty much. Cool. Uh, well, by nature, the project, uh, the Final Project is definitely Scrum-like, and we each month was one sprint, and we did utilize uh, product backlog. So every time that we began, right before we began a sprint, we'd fill up our product backlog with as much or as many features that we wanted to promise, uh, not necessarily directly off what we promised to our publisher, uh, GP Games. Uh, then we would filter those out from our product backlog into fill up a sprint and set up uh, confidence systems, bullpens. Um, we didn't do any Kanban stuff. It's not really, I guess, within the scope. Uh, but yeah, we followed sprints straight through and we tried to stay as agile as possible and in each milestone we tried to touch every feature we worked on last time to iterate on. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and it definitely shows. Great game, guys. Cool, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I was just wondering where you guys got your inspiration for Blank. Uh, I will pass this off to our design lead, Aaron Kurowski. <laughs> so the question was, where do we come with, with inspiration for the game? Uh, just well, for the character itself. Well, that would actually be mainly our uh, artist, Zach Winkler. The concept and all the concept art was actually him. So I'll actually give this to him. <laughs> Hello. Um, we had a game called Minion Wars, and uh, it was going to be an RTS with a bunch of woodland critters. And uh, 
that was a bad game. <laughs> and uh, we had to rewrite it like from the bike, the base. And I'd been playing a lot of Mod Nation racers. And uh, there's this base template, and he's just this white little blob guy. And I thought it might be kind of interesting to have a kind of blank looking character who had all these powers platforming his way through trials and tribulations. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sir? I, uh, I, uh, I noticed in uh, the problems that you, ha you guys had that uh, one of the bullet points was you had problems multi-threading. I was just curious what uh, issues that caused during the development process. The question was, issue, we have, what problems did we have with multi-threading? Yeah. Uh, I'll pass this off to our tech lead, Fao. So you're asking about our problems with multi-threading? Yep. Uh, we had multi-threading through the loading most of the game through, and that was fine. But the very last month, we did, uh, we did loading throughout the game. So while you're playing, it's loading in the next room in the previous room. And we put that in just at the last month, and that caused a lot of crashes. But luckily, we did solve them all. So it was just a small hump the last few weeks. OK. Thanks. And that's the last of, last of questions we can take. Oh, we have one more. So obviously, you guys built a really great platformer. Um, I designed a few of them. Uh, so obviously, the biggest problem I could think of would be how did you manage to balance everything out knowing that not only would your character be making all these difficult levels with one type of playthrough, but now you have like three or four that would be changing constantly. So how hard was it to balance out the levels for you guys? So the question was, how do we balance each gameplay type yeah. through the levels? And I'll pass this back to Aaron Karaski. Well, Making all of the levels was a very iterative process. We, uh, we knew how high like, the jump was gonna be and how high we wanted the air smash jump to be and how, like, how we wanted everything to work. And we just had to make the levels and try and make those numbers fit the levels we made. And it was, it was really just trial and error for the most part. Uh, we had the basic numbers down and what we expected, but the, uh, it was just, you just gotta try it and, and hope it works. Hope that answers your question. Thank you. <laughs> And that's all the questions for right now. Uh, before we go, if you liked our game, please like us on Facebook or Twitter. Just search for a blank video game, no spaces. Thank you all.